uh, hello to everyone who is virtually attending as well. So I thought instead of giving sort of the regular introductions, you can see who we are, but um, a little bit about how this session actually came together. So Abhinav and I were speaking about something completely different and we discovered that we have a common love for sport. And often we don't talk about recruiting for sports at these conferences. And so we said, why don't we put in a session and see how it goes? And unfortunately or fortunately, we're here now and it got selected. So um, <laughs> so we're here to give you a basic understanding about how sporting recruitment works, uh, particularly in the United States, in the UK, uh, and we'll cover Canada as well. And just some basics for the counselors here in terms of how you might want to approach training your students in that student journey. So it is for new counselors. It is basic information that we'll provide. And then hopefully in the next few conferences, we can build on that knowledge and, and really get into detail. So that's just, that's what the session is about today. Awesome. And let me just say that I've seen so many posts about IC3 on LinkedIn in the last few years that I cannot believe I'm presenting here now. So it's truly an honor. And uh, thanks to Veer for also pushing for this session. And very often I get a lot of questions on the sports recruitment aspect, uh, especially you know, from school counselors, because at times when a student asks you that, it's hard to address that. So again, the goal of this session is to provide some knowledge on that. But as you know, technical questions emerge in the future, very happy to sort of guide people on that as well. There's no problem. But uh, like we mentioned, we're, we're trying not to get too technical today and just keep an overview of uh, the different countries and what the recruitment process typically is like. So instead of doing a full presentation, what we've done is we've actually got videos through the session where we've interviewed or had some sessions or recordings of people who do recruit for sport or people who've actually been recruited for sport as well. So rather than just us talking and talking about our experience, we can also showcase some of those. So one thing we discussed, and Abhinav can come in here as well, but I think sport isn't just about playing professionally at university or playing at a very high level. I think sport is important for an overall experience when it comes to university life. And every student should want to go ahead and pick up, whether it's a new sport, whether it's something that they've played before, because it is important in that student journey and that, that experience that people have at university. So it's not just about wanting to play varsity sport or professional sport, but I think it's important for every student to pick up sport when they go to university. Yeah, and let me also add on the last point, if you can read that, uh, I was a student athlete in the US and we were repeatedly told that, you know, the work ethic that we have and what we're putting in, the hours that we are putting in every day uh, in terms of your sport, academics, managing everything at the same time, it builds a lot of work ethic, which, you know, carries on with you into your professional life as well. Whether that profession ends up being a career in sports or that's outside of sports, a lot of those characteristics, a lot of those learnings that you build do carry forward into life as well. And, you know, any of you who've been athletes growing up, have played a sport in school, you would probably relate to some of those things as they, a lot of those learnings do end up coming into the work life as well. Okay, so that's me. Uh, I was a lot fitter back then, as I've been having too much biryani clearly over the last few years. But um, so instead of just doing the regular introduction, so this is my sporting journey, actually. So I, as a junior, I played uh, golf. That was a sport that I majorly played. I played the, at the Indian Golf Union, so played all over India as a junior golfer. And then I went to the University of St. Andrews, where I initially played for the third team, and then slowly made my way up to the first, uh, to the second team. And the interesting one is actually table tennis. I mean, we think it's just, you know, fun and you have a table somewhere and it's nice to play. Um, I never played competitive table tennis. I started in my first year and by the fourth year, I was first team captain. So I, I that was a sport that I took up. So it's something that I never played before, but you actually took it up at university, loved it, and probably ended up playing more table tennis and golf at my time in, in, in university. But I think what's important is that when you talk about sport and you talk about whether it be personal statement writing, whether it be, um, you know, just showcasing different skills that you have to a university through the application process, sport is a great way at a school level, even to talk about things like teamwork, to talk about how you learn from failure. That's probably the only thing that 
sport really teaches you. There's nothing else that teaches you that. How to take failure in the right manner, to work on it. Uh, when we talk about discipline, we talk about sportsman spirit. It's something that when a person plays sport, it automatically gets ingrained in you. And these are skills that I can safely say there's universities here as well, that every university will be looking for in their students. So I recently played an alumni tournament in Delhi. You end up meeting, you know, 50, 60 people, you know, so sport is still such a big part of my life and it still helps me today, whether it be networking, reconnecting with schools and university students. So that's my sporting introduction. And let me tell you a little bit about my sporting journey. And it's it's funny that, you know, uh, Miss Dhingra, you're in the room because we go long back. <laughs> and And just a funny fact, as I was growing up, you know, you used to have a reading club in our condo and I was least interested. I was just not a very academic student. I was not driven to do well in academics. I just felt it's not for me. And slowly as I started playing football, that was my sport. And I started getting serious about it. I started realizing that to go certain places for football, for me, that was to a boarding school in the UK in the last three years of my school, I had to convince my parents that being in the UK in 10th grade when I'm 15 years old is something I can manage. And the biggest concern my father raised with me was how are you going to manage academics? Because, you know, you've got all the tuitions and classes and resources in India, but yet, you know, you're not performing. And somehow I went from like second gear to like fifth or sixth gear and I started doing well. And, and, and that's when I realized that it wasn't to do with the fact that, you know, I wasn't good at studying. It was actually to do with the fact that I just wasn't driven. There was no motivation. And sport actually made me work harder in academics as well. I went on to then play college soccer in the US or a scholarship uh, to play college soccer. That was the goal for me. It was to turn professional and again, not to kind of flaunt this out, someone who was in seventh Sorry, yes, someone who was in seventh or eighth grade in school getting B's and C's. I ended up graduating with like a 3.95 GPA from college. Uh, could never imagine that. And that only happened because in my head, I was just so clear that if I have to play the sport, it means I have to study well. And CAA, which is, you know, they govern the US sports uh, in, in colleges they actually require you to maintain a certain GPA. So you don't even have a choice. It's something that you had to do. So sports did a lot for me. Uh, of course. I think it is for your program three years. Yes, Somehow. correct. You missed out on one. <laughs> yes, that is true. Yeah, I, can... didn't, I didn't know we were allowed you the leaders. In this. I know, you can I... clearly see there's a fan there. <laughs> I mean, fun fact, we her son was one of my first students who had helped once I'd started working uh, in the counseling industry. And, and you know, I, after turning from the US, I tried professional football. I did actually have a couple of pro contracts also, but not at the level I wanted to play at. It was in the second, third division in India. I wanted to be at the top level. And I kind of said to myself that, I've done this for so many years. I've tried it out. And if I can't do it at the top level, I'd rather do something else and be very good at it. And that was my mindset. And my parents actually told me, why don't you take a year or two, try professional football, see how it works out. And they kind of posed the question to me that if you're going to give up that dream now, what was the point of us sending you to the UK, sending you to the US, going through all these experiences and Five years later, I mean, now it's been seven years, but four or five years later, I kind of went back to them and said, you remember that thing you said to me? Are you happy with where I am now? Because I would not be here if it wasn't for the sporting journey. So it's it's really interesting where sports can take you if you let it, if you're driven, if you're ambitious. And uh, I'm not the only one. I mean, there are plenty more people like Veer and me out there who have... Uh, done this and we still use a lot of those things that we learned out of the sport in in our lives today so just coming now from the university and college aspect 
uh, just a little bit of a difference in different countries. And, you know, we can't go into the details of every single country. And I'll also acknowledge and admit that, you know, I'm not an expert at every single country and how sports works, you know, in Australia and Croatia and Germany. So it's, it's beyond my scope. So we've included, you know, things that we do know, and uh, this will help you as a general idea. So just to start off with US, it is in, in the most basic sense, it's very structured and professional opportunities after US college sports do exist. That's provided that the sport is something that is recognized in the US at a high level. For example, if you're playing cricket, US may not be the place for you to go. But if you're playing golf, you're playing tennis, track and field, swimming, the opportunities are amazing. And when I say professional opportunities exist, there is an actual path that exists. So if you've heard of Michael Jordan, if you've heard of Tiger Woods, they all actually went to college and then they turned pro. So there is a clear path that exists about you know 60 to 80 players from each sport as they graduate will turn professional in their sports. The odds are still against you, which is where you know the US philosophy is a little different to Europe where they say that we know that less than 1% of you are gonna turn professional, which is why it is even more essential for all of you to have an undergrad degree. Versus when it comes to Europe typically, in a lot of sports, you'll see people go to university or go down the pro professional sporting route. Uh, but that does not mean that there is not sports at university in the UK or in Europe or in Canada. That exists. So it just depends on what your goals are, because you can go to some universities in the UK that are absolutely amazing with the kind of infrastructure they have and the opportunities they provide to athletes. But it just varies a little bit different uh, from the US. And I think from my end, I would say, okay, Canada, Europe. European countries, Australia, they're in a similar sort of range where they're not the purpose of sporting culture in universities there is not to make someone professional. Now that does happen, let me also add that. Uh, in the UK, you will have some universities where, you know, Loughborough actually produces a lot of athletes that compete in Olympics. So there will be certain exceptions to what I just said there, not trying to generalize in any way. Uh, but typically you will find that balance where someone is trying to go professional, they might want to look at the US versus some of the other countries. And Veer, if you want, you can add there as well. No, and I think it's it's only right for us to be honest with that. So I think if you're looking and you want to play varsity sport, you want to take sport up in a professional manner, then I think unless it's a particular sport that isn't played in the US, I think the infrastructure and the professional route in the US is something that students will want to look at. Having said that, where, and I can give my experience there, that what I have found is in the UK, you can actually play to whatever level you want to play to. So if you're not playing at a varsity level in the US, it can often be quite difficult to pick up the sport. You might have to get your own membership when it comes to golf or whatever. So if you're in the main team, you're really well taken care of. Whereas in the UK, you might not be at that professional level. But if you want to continue your hobby, there'll be first team, second team, third team. You can book out a pitch if you want to. So it allows you to take up sport in a hobby as well, which is what a lot of students want to do. But there's no doubt that that structured route that you know you spoke about, I think the US is known for that and they provide a really good infrastructure when it comes to sport for that. Yeah, and that's a really good point that if it's something that you're thinking of it as a hobby and very often we have student athletes that we work with who we sort of say after an assessment that, based on your level, you may not be able to get recruited at any level in the US system because it is tough. It's not easy for anyone to wake up one day and say, I'm a high school footballer and I want to get recruited. There will be certain assessment criteria there. And if we feel that it may not work for you, we will then recommend the academic path, but you can still explore and play sport at university. The only difference is you can do that in the UK and other countries as well. You're not limited then to the US. Sure. So, 
So we'll cover part of that. If I don't cover it, then we can we can pick it up uh, later as well. Yeah. But here's again some some generalized information here, and I think this is important for counselors because it's it actually talks about how you prepare your students when it comes to the sport journey. So when we talk about the United States, and we've covered a little bit of this, there's a big impact on your admissions process. So if you get recruited for sport, it might mean there's a certain quota that the sports department has. It might be that, you know, you can, your SAT scores or whatever, there might be some leeway over there. Your process starts a lot earlier and there's a clear path that exists. So you actually build up, you work with the directors of sport and at particular universities. And so the impact on your admissions process can be quite high. Whereas when you look at the UK, um, your coach communication doesn't have to be necessarily before you apply. And the impact on admission actually in terms of your grades is is realistically non-existent. So for the UK, it doesn't matter whether you're playing sport or not, you have to meet the grade requirements first. Once you meet those grade requirements, then yes, there's obviously sporting teams you can compete at a you know, British level. So we've got the, the Bucks, which is the British University's um, championship. They do that. And then you've got the Scottish ones and so on. But it's not necessary that you have to communicate with the coach before. It can happen after. And in terms of the grades, you have to meet the grade boundaries. There's never going to be a concession there when it comes to the UK, where the US might have that. And again, in the UK is great for some sports. And I'll, there's a slide that I'll, I'll share later. Um, for example, cricket, hockey, golf in Scotland. You know, there's certain sports that are very focused on the UK. And the UK has a brilliant sports culture as well. So anyone who loves sport, you've got the Premier League, you've got the British Open happening every year, you've got Wimbledon happening every year. So there's a lot of sport around that. Um, anything you wanted to add from a, a US perspective that I might have missed? Yeah, I mean, I think in its most simplistic form, we sort of covered it, but just to put it into two lines, think of the US as, uh, as you asked, you know, your question about the timeline it is a bit different. You, you're you trying to invest a year or two years prior to applying to the college. So if you're looking at, let's say, an early decision or regular decision for the US, the goal for you should be a year and a half in advance, you've started communicating with college coaches, which, me, which means you're sending your profile and we'll go into what, what that kind of looks like and what's that uh, what all that's about. But you the timeline is a bit different. Versus in all other countries, the coach may not have any impact on admissions. And also they're not, they're not looking to recruit teams before you get admitted. They first want to see, have you gotten admitted to the university? And if you have, let us see your sports credentials, and then we can decide whether you're on the team or not. In the US, on the other hand, the coach can decide beforehand, before you even apply, that yes, you've got a strong shot and you have been cleared by admissions. We'll talk a little bit about that as well later. And we encourage you to apply, which means you actually have a guaranteed spot on the team at that point. So you're applying ED1 or you're applying regular decision and you know as long as you're getting in, uh, you have a spot on the team. So that's the main difference there. And let me add one more there, which I think we sort of touched upon that there are lots of clubs and all outside of university also in the UK. In fact, if we at any point feel that someone cannot get recruited in some of the US colleges for their sport, we actually recommend them to look at the UK if they're looking at it as a hobby. Reason being because UK as a country, you can commute easily. So if you're not getting into the first team on campus, you can go, you know, take a public transport, bus, train, and find a local club to play at. US very often, for those of us who have traveled, you'll know it's not easy. Sometimes commute in the US is terrifying. And if you're in certain areas, public transport is brilliant. In other areas, it is not. You may need to have a car. So if you're not getting that opportunity on the varsity team at college, you have to sort of question how much money will you be spending on Ubers and other kind of transportation in the US if you're trying to play the sport on your own, not under the university's umbrella. Yeah, and I think, you know, we can move on, but I've covered a little bit of this here, but something that I want to share from my personal experience was that um, even for the UK, 
So when I was playing golf and I got in touch with the coach after I had my admission confirmed, they invited me for something called preseason. Now we, I came from you know a school in Delhi and we don't actually know what these things mean. I booked my tickets and they said, you know that if you want you can come for preseason, but it's not compulsory. And I thought I don't want to rebook and you know the money and all that came into play. Um, I really wish if I could go back in time, I wish I'd gone for preseason. Because I've showed on the first slide, I started with the third team. If I had gone for preseason, I would have probably started with the second team. So sometimes just knowing those subtle differences in the countries to make sure that you know you give yourself the best shot when you go, so that you can work your way up in in your university is also important. So I think I've covered a lot of that, but uh, we'll move on to the next one. I think so. Here's uh, so here's actually is one of my closest friends, but. He uh, played cricket in Durham and then played at various levels after that, including, uh, you know, he got picked in the IPL and so on. So this is his journey. And of course, we're not in any way promoting any particular college. These are just examples here. Um, but just to give you a different voice and what people and what sportsmen in particular consider, because you'll find that it's not just about, okay, I want to go to Durham or so on and whatever the place is but it's actually other considerations that come into play do i want to be in your friends do i want to be in your family do i want to stay in india and continue playing the sport so some of these conversations i think will help also so I was interested in the So I think that gives you an idea. Now, if you're going for cricket, now how many of us would know that the MCC actually only has six universities? 
or they cater to six counties over there. We won't know. So again, it's very specific. If you're coming for golf, there's certain specific programs that are good for you. If you want to play football, where do you want to go within the UK? So I think when you're talking about the UK and Canada, then you're talking about building a strong profile. This obviously comes with time. Uh, reaching out to coaches. And this is something that in the United Kingdom, actually, people are more open to now. I can see Bath is over here. Is that the case with you? Are you are you quite open now to receiving most direct sport contacts with students and, and the directors of sport? Or Okay. So students can reach out to them directly before. What's the process? Okay. Okay, so again, there's another example there where it's after the admissions process. And so they would connect you with the sporting directors once you've applied, met the grades and so on. Whereas as we discussed with the US, it's before. And again, understand what the university is about. Now, if someone comes to me for cricket, Scotland just isn't your place. You know, it just isn't because it's cold through, you know, six months of the year. You can't play cricket, whereas other places in England have a better infrastructure. And if the MCC body is catering to those places, then obviously it gives you a better standing over there. Yeah, and, and just to touch on MCC, it, it has about, I think, eight or nine universities. So let's say if Oxford as a county uh, is playing or they have a club, Oxford University and then also Oxford Brooks is a part of it. Similarly, there are, you know, other universities. Leeds, I think, has a consortium of three universities that play together. So the idea is, again, you're not getting recruited beforehand, but you're just sort of catering your college list, university list to apply to five universities where MCC exists. Now it's on you to reach that university and then sort of prove your worth and get on that team. It's not guaranteed that you will be there, but at least you can, you know, shortlist your universities and build a list based on that. And I'll just add one thing on Canada here. There are a couple of universities in Canada that actually are a part of the US NCAA system. So, uh, you know, one or two universities, one that comes to mind is Simon Fraser, if anyone's aware of it, that actually competes in NCAA Division II. So there are a couple of Canadian universities that are a part of the US NCAA system. Why that is, I'm not sure, but it's just there. So coming to varsity sports in the US now, uh, what do we mean by the word and term varsity firstly? It is something, you know, where when we say sports are serious, professional opportunities exist, we're talking about varsity sports. You will also hear a term called club sports. So when very often... If, you know, as counselors, you would ask your students to do research on clubs and organizations that exist at universities, very often you'll come across club sports over there. You'll realize that a certain university has a men's soccer club uh, team, but they also have a men's varsity soccer team. Now, varsity is where the recruitment aspect comes in, where you speak to coaches in advance and then sort of try and get on that team and then apply to colleges. Another, you know, big reason why lots of people do it, it's because, you know, pro opportunities, scholarships exist. Uh, there are lots of Indian athletes, depending on the sports, who go every year on full ride scholarships to the US. Uh, literally zero money spent, everything, room and board to that extent is covered. Now, that doesn't happen for every sport. Uh, we have over the years seen that Indians have done well in certain sports, but not in every single sport. So also depends, you know, the scholarship figures vary based on that and how competitive the nature of U.S. college sports would be. And let me also add the last point, which is, you know, some students will, this is a bonus that your admissions process can become slightly easier, but I always encourage students to think in a way this should not be your goal or your criteria to say, I want to be a college athlete. Because if you're just thinking, how do I sort of, you know, break the system and, and use the sports pathway to get in, it's not going to work because it requires a lot of hard work to get recruited in the first place. You need to be a very, very committed athlete for a coach to even recruit you. It sounds easy that if you're recruited, admissions becomes easier but what everyone doesn't tell you is to get recruited in the first place is an extremely hard task. 
for sure. <laughs> You'll know because your son's also done it. Uh, I mean, I'm just a point on scholarships. I think it's really important from an access perspective as well. So even for in the UK, you can get scholarships for sport. The only difference is the process starts later. But there are scholarships across the world for sporting um, endeavors. And so definitely something that you want to look at. Correct. 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 And that's good. Let you start early and you know where you stand even before sometimes when you apply. And, and another relevant point there, uh, which I think maybe we could have included, but uh, for a lot of you, you know, you're at school, so it may not be relevant, but it's just good for information. At the post-grad level, US may not be able to offer you much. Uh, the way the US college system works at the sport level is that you get four years of eligibility by the NCAA, so you can compete for four years. Now, typically what happens is whenever a coach is recruiting, they don't want to recruit someone just for a year or two years for the master's program because they have enough talent coming in for undergrad. There are exceptions to that where, you know, there are sporting programs where they can't fill the seats. They may be open to master's. The only situations where I've seen master's students, you know, sort of make that happen is if you, let's say, finished your undergrad in three years, and you stayed at the same university for a master's and you played for the fourth year. So if you're already in the system, you're already on the team, you just accelerated your program and then did your master's for the fourth year, it's worked for many student athletes. But let's say someone who's been in India and just going for a postgrad, UK actually might be a better place because you still have the same opportunities to sporting facilities that an undergrad student would have in the UK. And there are scholarships there as well at postgrad level. Yes. Yeah. So the timeline, the yeah, the the exact timeline of that is so NCAA permits a coach to make a verbal offer to a student athlete in the summer of when you're transitioning from grade 10 to grade 11, June 15th of that year, and like any college, like a Stanford can go to a golfer and say, hey, we want you, we have a full scholarship. The, you know, the student says yes, and that's it, you're done. Now, a year and a half later in November, you'll have a written agreement now with that coach as well. You'll apply and uh, you can, I mean, assume as long as you've maintained decent grades that you're getting in. So you can be committing to colleges in the U.S. as early as, you know, the end of grade 10. Who should be a student athlete? Super important. Athletic benchmarks are very important. Very often, I will have to, you know, explain to student athletes that, unfortunately, we don't think you have the level to play varsity sports. That does not mean quit sports. That means carry on, take that as a hobby, keep that as a common app activity, Use that in your UCAS personal statement if you can, relating to your course, of course, but you may not be able to do varsity. Why is that so important? Because then that student needs to have that clarity and needs to know that instead of investing, you know, X number of hours into my sport, I may have to focus on other things as well. It's important to get uh, for them to get that clarity rather than get to the end of the application cycle and realize, hey, I'm not getting recruited and I have not done anything in the last year to put myself in a position, enable myself to get a decent academic admission. So doing some level of you know, evaluation is important, typically for sports like uh, swimming, track and field, there are very quantitative measures that exist, but sports like even golf, it's, it's a numbers game, but even there, there is a lot of qualitative stuff that comes in soccer, basketball, squash to a large degree is qualitative. So we encourage student athletes to first do an evaluation with us. And then we kind of even recommend, is this even the path for you or not? Uh, but that's just important. Just if a student comes to you and says, I want to be a student athlete, don't assume that they're going to successfully get recruited. Encourage them to reach out to coaches 
and let them get some feedback. Coaches in the US will tell them what they think of their level and they'll be honest about that. Okay, so just to uh, give you an example there, there was someone I met who just won a golf tournament in India at an under 18 level. Went to the US and played tennis with him. That's not uncommon. So again, what your levels are in India do not affect what your levels might be at. You have to be very realistic when you're making that choice and committing your future in sport that you have that level to have the ability at that level. Yeah. But, but like you said, there's some that have a qualitative benchmark, right? So that would be, let's say you're running and what your speed is over a particular um, distance, you know, so those you can track. When it comes to things like team sports, it's very difficult to do that. That's where you might have to, again, I'll give you two guys who will actually send sort of their scores over and over to long period. We have sort of your coaches who will be able to they can analyze your score. They come to India, a lot of the coaches, they might be able to see you in person to see if they can train you in the right way or not. Um, so they're de definitely looking for qualitative measures, especially in team sports that you can do, um, to make sure that you get providing the best for the best school. So but even in even even in even in team sports, you can show showcase those. So let's say, for example, a sport like soccer, you'll rely heavily on videos, match videos to be seen. The reason something like soccer is so qualitative in nature is that when you watch a video, uh, let's say if I'm running past you, the video can't show you whether that person is slow or whether I'm really fast. It, it can't tell you that. So coaches can't put that context into a US context and imagine what that will be like when you're playing here. The other thing is it also depends on where that country is in sport at its own level, in the global rankings, let's say. So football is a sport where you will see a lot of people getting recruited from Europe, from South America, from US itself. So India for them on that map, it's it's not there. We have to kind of, we encourage the kids that you have to show them at times, we have to kind of educate the coaches on what the level is, what the leagues are over here, so that they understand and they can contextualize that. But it's hard for them to understand if you're playing at the national level in India, well, what does that mean? You know, when you come to the US, how will that translate when you're playing here? Similarly, in track and field and swimming, it's very time-based. You know, 100 meters in India is also 100 meters in the US. So it's very easy to kind of do that. But in sports like soccer, basketball becomes very, very tough. And even in something is, you know, golf, uh, it is numbers driven. There are scoring averages that you have. So let's say if I'm shooting 74 and that's a good number, but now where it gets qualitative is that the top colleges in the U S will look at it and say, what was the field of play? Which means were you playing a tournament with five other boys or were you playing a tournament with 150 others? Because how was the competition? Were you able to deal with the pressure that came with it? How tough was the golf course? What was the yardage that you were playing? So there is some bit of qualitative nature to that that comes. We have a lot of Indian golfers that do very well in India, but then they'll go play some of the most competitive tournaments in the US. There's one called IMG World Junior in California happens every summer and they'll just do terrible. So, and some do very well. And this was again, not to kind of promote any colleges. I was with the Northwestern golf coach last summer and he said, IMG is a tournament where we separate the boys from the men. So they're like, that's where we see that if you're shooting 72, can you shoot 72 there? Or are you going to shoot 80 over there? So there is a lot of qualitative nature to it, but uh, how do you do that is, is the tough part because you need a lot of context on the sport. And uh, I mean, I don't know if I'm allowed to do this or not, but I mean, I'm happy to support there from time to time to school counselors. If you ever have a query like that and you have a soccer player, you have their video, send it across. I can at least offer some level of, you know, feedback there. Uh, I think we're running a little tight on time, but uh, 
we just wanted to show you a few videos of uh, the recruitment process. This is, these are college coaches. So this is Wesleyan squash coach. And then you'll also hear from the U Chicago swim coach on what the recruitment process for them is like. So we do actually recruit quite a number of international athletes um, through people like yourself at Next Track Consulting. Uh, it's really helpful to us that you bring the students to us, in fact, and um, that's worked out very well. Uh, there are uh, other ways that we find students through national governing bodies. Uh, and, and you know, a lot of students find us too. And I think there's a little bit of a reputation out there that you want to play college. College squash is exciting in the US. And I think internationally, a lot of eyes are looking at it as an opportunity. But we also recruit from the US too. And uh, similar, similar methods. Yeah, so I think we're in a pretty, uh, pretty nice position because the university, our program generates a lot of interest from top student athletes from across the world. So it's a little bit easier for us to recruit than maybe some other smaller liberal arts schools or Division three schools or even mid-major D1 schools. So uh, most of the time we are connecting with recruits who are contacting us first, either directly through email uh, or filling out a recruit questionnaire. And then we have recruiting services like yourself who will contact us and will develop the relationships with them. And they'll send us some recruits who are interested in it or you know, they're asking us you know, what we're looking for. So we get some recruits there. But uh, there's very few that we are contacting with us having them contact us first. Um, so just to sort of sum that up there, how do coaches recruit? It is majorly student athletes reaching out to coaches with, you know, a bit of an athletic profile that they've built uh, in terms of their sport. And that's the primary way college coaches will recruit. Uh, email is the best thing to do. And just a word of advice for all school counselors, you might have student athletes that will come and tell you, well, I didn't get a response. And that does happen a lot, but just encourage them to, you know, stay at it, keep sending emails every couple of months with new updates, because I always say this, that uh, college coaches just have a lot going on. You know, they're also like the logistics manager as to if you're traveling for a tournament, where is the team going to eat? Uh, practice all the different things they take care of. So sometimes emails get missed. And if you're still not getting responses, let's say four or five months later after three, four emails, that's also something that you need to read into and perhaps kind of say that maybe that's not the place where I'm getting a chance because more often than not, if you spend four or five emails, the coach has read that, but they may not take out the time to respond. Uh, recruitment services counselors also play a role here and coaches can also reach out to student athletes after seeing them at tournaments in the US that can also be in India. Squash is actually a, a sport where a lot of squash coaches from the US travel to India quite often uh, and you know there's one of the Indian squash coaches is now actually a coach at an Ivy League school so squash circuit specifically the coaches actually recognize the Indian talent really well. They can look at the ranks of a squash player athlete and tell how well they're going to fit at their school. There are college showcases and camps as well, which typically happen in the summer. So a lot of student athletes will also choose to participate in those. Quick thing here. Yeah, so the showcase camps typically will happen in the US because you want to perform in front of them. And the main goal there is for you to play in front of them so they can, you know, that context I was saying earlier, like in a sport like soccer, that's not there anymore because now you're competing with everyone else in the US. Of course. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You have to, this process is something that you, you want to start earlier and at times even earlier than grade 10 reason being because you want to quickly evaluate whether you have a shot at getting recruited or not. Cause if you don't, 
you might want to focus on other aspects of profile building, extracurriculars, those sort of elements as well. Uh, I'll be very honest, it's hard for a student athlete to play the sport at a very intense level, maintain good academics and do profile building. So the main thing that kind of takes a backseat is that additional profile building because academics cannot. And maybe I'll skip past this video. Hello, King. Uh, but the main thing here, the message here was you do need a good academic standing. While we earlier said that in the admissions process, the coach can make a difference. There can be an impact. It depends from university to university. If you're a top athletic university, you can perhaps have a lot of say in the admissions process, but if you're not, you may not have that. So I would kind of always put that as slightly lower academic benchmarks. That doesn't mean you can just be really low at a level and you can't get recruited uh, and expect to get recruited. Sorry. Sometimes the benchmarks can be very low. If you're like, a golf prodigy, you might get recruited to a top college in the US, but that exception, the coach might be only be able to make for that one athlete, not for all four that are being recruited. So always encourage students because very often student athletes, you know, once they go on Google and all, they, they figure these things out. Very often we'll get uh, this question that, you know, I've heard that my academics can be really low and I can get in because I'm getting recruited. And that's not always true. It depends on how the coach looks at you, values you, and the admissions process in general. Yes, I see your hand there. So I mean, I think across different sports, I would say probably 80 to 100 now. Yeah. No, no, I just mean India. Just India. But across, I mean, you in NCAA in the US, across all the colleges, you have about almost 500,000 student athletes playing across different sports, men's and women's. Yes. Correct. Yeah. And, uh, Sorry, say. Oh. Yeah, it's also the awareness. And, and let me just say this 100 is probably growing each year. Five years ago, this probably this number was not 100. So slowly with the awareness, it's, you know, at times you're good as a student athlete. You just don't know this process or this path even exists. So that also happens quite often. So the sooner the students also know this is an opportunity that exists for them. Uh, if you ask me what talent exists and how many can go, it will be a lot more than a hundred. It's just that the awareness is, you know, not there and it's not an easy process to also execute. Uh, yes. Right. Latest could be, I mean, if you're an institute that has EDs and RDs, then that November, December itself, you can get recruited as late as that. But I mean, lots of universities who have rolling application deadlines, it can even go in that last part of grade 12, actually. Yeah. Can I, can I step in? Because we have already gone over time. Yes. So, but we'll hang around and, you know, Happy to answer any questions, but um, anything you want to just quickly conclude with, and then we can probably chat through the rest later because I know that. Yeah, uh, no, not much. I mean, this is just, I mean, in terms of anyone looking at the US for the student athlete route, uh, these are some of the steps to kind of consider. And very quickly, I'll touch on this seventh point, which is a pre-read process. I'd mentioned earlier that uh, before you're applying to university, you actually have an idea you're getting recruited. Now the coach, what they'll do is let's say in your application, your three to four months prior of your application deadline, they will start to finalize who they want to recruit. Let's say they have four spots on the golf team. They will shortlist eight students, take their academics, go to admissions internally and check whether the student has the benchmarks to get admitted or not. 
basically if this application comes to us in November, are we likely to accept the student or not? And then the admissions will get back to the coach and say, yes, no, maybe if the SAT improves, maybe if the predicted improves, there's a chance. And that's that's never a hundred percent from the coach's side, because of course your essays and activities, all those things make a difference too. But typically 95% of times you will find that if the coach is coming back and saying, yes, your pre-read was positive, they will recruit you and it's very likely that you're going to get in. And uh, let me also just say that a lot of coaches will tell you that we want you to apply ED1 because if we're giving you that spot, that means you need to commit to us because the spot doesn't come back to them. So if you get rejected or you decide you're going to go somewhere else, they don't have another spot to replace someone else with. Correct. If it's a long answer, then take it on later. Uh, I'm, I'm really, really giving me time, uh, this thing. But we'll hang around. Ma'am, we'll hang around and stay. But just want to conclude. And uh, I want to thank Abhinav here because he came on my invite. And uh, this was just a session born out of our love for sport. And so hopefully, you know, it's something that's helped the counselors here. But he's here. Please. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you 